Good evening, everybody. This is Katrina Olimoyoy from Caring, and I'm joined today by uh, with uh, by Shansa Ramzan Jav uh, from Mongolia, who's up very late tonight um, to tell us about some exciting work that we have together on the ground. So um, it's great to be here. Thank you for joining, and we're excited to begin. Um, Shansa, I just want to double check and make sure that you are that you're there and that everyone can hear you. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Great. Okay, so let's um, let's get started. Um, so we want to spend the next thirty minutes really taking you on a journey to talk about why we care so much about regenerative materials in fashion um, and what that really means. And so uh, we'll get into it, but we're talking about the birthplace of the materials that so many of us use: so wool, cashmere, cotton, and so on. Um, We'll begin by giving an overview of why, why talk about raw materials at all, uh, and then make some comments about this shift that you might have noticed that's underway in the industry towards regenerative agriculture um, and what that really means. And then I will be joined by Shansa to really do a deep dive on the South Gobi Kashmir project uh, in Mongolia. Shansa is an ecologist by training, um, so it's really great to have her perspective and she is the manager of the program, which has been running for about five years now. Uh, we'll then finish up by talking about how we can scale regenerative agriculture across the industry, um, as well as some key takeaways that we've learned together over, the, over many years. Um, and then just one comment, which is that we would love to see what questions you have for us. So please post them in the chat. Um, we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. Okay, so, so to kick off then, um, there's this question, why, why focus on raw materials? Um, and I think for many fashion companies out there, there's this real question around, you know, what are my environmental impacts and where are they biggest when I look across the supply chain? Um, at Caring, we've been using a very pioneering tool called the Environmental Profit and Loss Account um, since 2012, and it really helps us answer exactly that question. And so as you'll see here on the screen, uh, I'm showing you the results from 2019 and what becomes obvious very quickly is that our largest environmental impacts are not in what we call tier zero. They're not in our stores or our warehouses or our offices where we have direct control, um, but they actually happen way back at the birthplace of these raw materials, uh, which is in tier four. And specifically, you can see there's this very large green bubble here. Um, which is the environmental impact around land use. So how much land is used to produce all of the materials that end up in our supply chain, um, as well as greenhouse gases. And so this has been a very powerful tool for us because it's really helped us zoom in and figure out where we should prioritize um, action and programming. Now, I think many, many of our listeners have probably heard the term regenerative agriculture. Um, I think that there are a lot of questions around what, what does that really mean? And at Caring, I think it's important to emphasize that it means something slightly different depending on the particular um, system you're talking about. And so regenerative agriculture in cotton will look very different than regenerative agriculture in wool farming, for instance. Um, now what ties it all together, however, is that it, it takes a completely um, different approach to farming, which is instead of saying merely, let's try to minimize the negative impacts of agriculture, let's completely flip that paradigm on its head and instead let's push for net positive impacts. Um, how is that done? Well, as I mentioned, it depends on which particular type of farming you're talking about. Uh, and so um, there's a big emphasis, however, on the health of the soils. Um, and a lot of regenerative agriculture begins with the health of the soils. Uh, and so a lot of it is around how do we keep carbon in the soils? How do we improve the water retention ability of the soils? Um, and then in addition to that, it takes a very sort of holistic approach to farming um, and works to protect both so soil biodiversity as well as the biodiversity um, off the farm, um, as well as crop biodiversity. And so there's a shift away from monocultures into um, growing a diversity of species. So I I've mentioned that many in fashion are now um, making, I think, important strides into regenerative agriculture. And for those of you who also work um, outside of the industry, 
this shift is very much underway in the food sector as well. Um, just this year, we've seen millions and millions of dollars being um, poured into new funds that are being launched by the likes of Danone, Unilever, Nestle, um, and most recently Walmart as well. So this is, it's a very exciting time to be in this field and to really ask the question, how do we transform what happens at the very beginning of the supply chain where all of our materials begin their lives? Um, and so I thought it would be great to really um, bring this, this idea to life um, by having a conversation with Shansa, who's been managing, as I mentioned, this program that we run together in Mongolia um, that, that um, works on Kashmir and specifically on Kashmir farming. And so I would love to invite Shansa on um, and to really to kick off with a question around um, the context. And so Shansa, if you can just help the listeners understand for those who are not aware, um, Kashmir is this beautiful product that we all know and love very much, but I, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of the history of the Kashmir industry um, and what's happened in Mongolia in the last few decades that you think has created a situation where we really needed to put uh, programs in place on the ground. So over to you, Shansa. Thank you, Katrina. And uh, some of you may know the where is Mongolia. Mongolia is the country located in the Central Asia in between Russia and China. And uh, Kashmir production in Mongolia is uh, different than the Kashmir production in uh, different countries, especially like China. And because in Mongolia, uh, is, uh, Mongolia has had a nomadic pastoral production system for at least 1,000 years and possibly as long as 4,000 years. And uh, the we Mongolians harvest Kashmir from the goats graze in open rangeland, which is different than China, where Kashmir is harvested from the farmed, um, farmed goats. And uh, <clears throat> in the past two decades, the market demand for Kashmir has increased and is focused on not the quality of Kashmir, but rather on quantity of Kashmir. In response to that, herders have increased their goats, and the number of goats has tripled over the last three decades. This has led to the degradation of rangeland. And at some time, Climate is changing in Mongolia. Soil surface temperature has increased for two Celsius, and which is greater than the global average. And the <clears throat> uh, precipitation pattern and the amount of precipitation has changed over the last 60 years. So when it comes to the biodiversity in the ecosystem, it's increasing livestock numbers compete with wildlife over habitat and forage resources especially during winter, which is a very critical time of the year when both livestock and wild ungulates depend on standing dead vegetation from the prior growing season. If you take this together, the increase of goat numbers and then the increase of the temperature and the changes in rainfall, you understand quickly that why there was a deteriorating region condition on the ground. This in turn meant that decreased quality of livestock and livestock products. So with this situation, South Gobi Kashmir project has started in 2016 with the support from the Kiring and also uh, invest, uh, which also invested along with the following funding support from Ayutolgo Mine since 2017. So we work with two herder cooperatives in two districts of the southern province of Mongolia. And these two districts are located on the dry desert and semi-desert ecological zones where rainfall varies a lot, both specially and temporally. And the one of the cooperative is quite large. You can see on the, on the slide uh, with over 100 families joined in this group. And another cooperative is quite small, about 21 herder member families. And then all together, we are working together to manage about 200 50 hectares of rangeland. Okay, great, Chansa. Um, and so I think that really leads to the next question, which is around um, what, does, what does grazing really look like on the ground? Um, and how is it that, uh, that the owners of these Kashmir goats figure out exactly where um, to move their goats over the course of the year? Okay. So to understand the project, it helps also to know a little bit about the rangeland use in Mongolia. 
In Mongolia, rangelands are common property uh, access, uh, common access property, sorry. And as shown in this picture, uh, during the winter and then spring time, rangeland use is, is very well defined and ruled by collective norms because it's a very critical time of the year. Livestock rely on this uh, standing dead vegetation. But the summer and the autumn periods, however, herders have to move in a wide, across wider uh, areas, especially in the area where we work in uh, uh, arid rangelands. And that this, um, when it comes to the water, accessing water, it's completely dependent on the water wells. And well access is legally public domain, but in practice, small groups of herders usually uh, often control. Uh, in Mongolia, also rangeland use planning and the uh, implementation is fully regu poorly regulated and facilitated the government, especially in the local level. And it's because of the due to human capacity and skills and also uh, financial shortages. Herders strategy under this, you know, the unregulated or uncoordinated uh, time with increasing livestock number was to, to gain the short-term benefits or the, uh, at the expense of the long-term sustainability of rangeland uses. So like we know that this is the, some form of the example of the tragedy of the commons problem. To get away from this and then also move towards more sustainable um, model, it requires a strong coordinated approach in developing rangeland use plan and its implementation so that it can help to improve the rangeland condition and improve the livestock quality. Uh, we think the herders play a very critical role in this, you know, in this process and to disrupt this visual, vicious, vicious uh, cycle, downward cycle. So that's why our project really trying to bring all these herders on the table. You can see in the picture also and discuss about what is the current problem, what will be the long-term you know, effect if we continue like this, and then how we can change this practice, who can play the critical role. So that's why we are trying, really trying to improve the awareness and knowledge uh, about herders and then work towards the sustainable uh, livestock production and sustainable Kashmir production. And then in the long run, herders can actually really benefit from the quality, not from the quantity. Okay, that thanks. That's, yeah, that's a great, it's a really great summary. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that as people become aware of the sort of the nuance um, around herding and the sort of the strategies that herders employ, uh, employ to find mm -hmm. uh, grass for their goats, I think is, is super helpful. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, and the next question that I have for you is really mm -hmm. about the role of WCS in all of this. Um, you're an ecologist by training, and I know that you work with a lot of other scientists on your team. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I thought it would be great if we could spend a couple of minutes just really talking about um, what does this look like on the ground? How is it exactly that you measure um, changes in the health of, uh, of the ecosystem? Yeah, so as I was mentioning before, we are really trying to bring all our cooperative workers on the table and then discuss, but also at some time, we really want to bring back this some the real science-based information to, to be able to have better planning and then better implementation. So what we are really doing is uh, try to uh, do the arrangement monitoring every year in August. And uh, we, are with the collaboration of the Arthur Riley Institute from Australia, we developed the rangeland condition metric model. And when we do the rangeland monitor, we collect the vegetation and then soil data, and then plug this information into this uh, condition metric model. And then we get the number, which is very easy for all audiences to understand. And then the model provides us the number. And this number is, um, uh, can you use from, from zero being very bad or irreversibly degraded rangeland to the 100 being the very pristine good rangeland condition. And then we bring this information to our cooperative herders and then discuss and then help use this information to develop the rangeland use plan for following years. And uh, 
in the picture, you can see the person who is lying on the on the land is me <laughs> last year. <laughs> we collecting the data, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this information actually really helps us to communicate, you know, with the local government and to educate or to bring this information. What's happening? What is the state of the rangeland condition? How we can work? How we can improve? What level and what stage we should really take? And at some time also in the map, in this slide on the left hand, you can see we also did this uh, rangeland use boundary by each of our cooperative families and then bringing this you know, condition score and then individual family level versus the cooperative level rangeland management planning is really, uh, it really uses this rangeland condition score. So that's what we are really trying to uh, Bring. Great. No, it's 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 really exciting stuff. And I think that, um, you know, from from our side, I think um, it's a it's a especially powerful partnership because it enables our brands to actually make a direct connection with the herders. And so there's a very um, clear relationship there when it comes to our sourcing and also um, helping invest in sustainable best practices on the ground. So um, this is, it's really a great project and we're excited to see um, what's next. But I think maybe before we get into that, um, I wanted to spend a couple minutes just talking about uh, Caring's sort of work in this area. Um, some of the listeners might have seen that back in July, we launched our biodiversity strategy. And in that, we also um, made an announcement that we're starting a fund now in regenerative agriculture. And the whole idea here is to take some of the best practices and the learnings from the, the Mongolia project in, um, sorry, the Mongolia Kashmir project um, and to scale that into other materials um, that, are, that have very high environmental impact when you look at our uh, environmental profit and loss account, which I went over earlier. Uh, and so the idea here is really, you know, when you, when you talk about raw material producers um, at the beginning of the supply chain and you are asking them to go on this journey into more sustainable practices, there's risk there. And um, we recognize that that requires funding and it requires partnerships. Uh, and so the whole purpose of this fund is to really walk with raw material producers on this journey, um, not just in Mongolia, but in many, many other countries around the world. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we announced the fund in July. Um, and we will start accepting applications for it in early 2021 with a focus on co leather, cotton, cashmere, and wool. Um, so this is, uh, this is a work in progress and I would encourage people to just keep an eye on our website. We'll have a lot more information about this soon and how, um, how organizations and companies can apply if they're interested. Um, just, okay, we have a few more minutes. And so I thought we could just summarize some of the key takeaways um, from this work that we've been doing in partnership with WCS. Um, and then maybe if we have time, we'll take a question or two. Um, so to begin with, I think there is this question around understanding your sourcing if you're a fashion company. Where is it that your raw materials come from? Um, and what are the environmental impacts of those materials? Because that really helps drive smart um, investments in sustainable practices. Um, the second point, and I think Shanza has illustrated this really well, is the, the importance of patience. So it takes a long time to see um, environments change and to measure that change on the ground. And so these are the types of projects that you just, you can't parachute in for one year and expect to see um, really positive improvements. It requires a long-term partnership and continuous um, investment. Uh, the third point is around certainty and risk. As I mentioned, herders um, and other raw material producers carry a lot of risk. And so the extent to which brands can provide offtake agreements um, and long-term sustainable partnerships really goes a long way. Um, Shansa, I think has also illustrated this point very well, which is the importance of working with scientific um, communities, NGO partners and so on, um, because the work that we're talking about that that has to happen on the ground really requires a very rigorous um, approach. Uh, and then finally, and this is I think the call 
that we would really make to other brands out there is that we should work together to consider co-investing in these types of projects um, at the beginning of the supply chain in a pre-competitive way. Um, ultimately, we're all sourcing very similar materials from similar landscapes. And if we're able to you know, join hands and really drive this change on the ground, um, that's a fantastic thing. And it's something that we're very receptive to. Um, okay, I'm going to turn over to my other screen over here. So forgive me, please. But I've been watching questions as they come in. Um, the first question and um, is for Shadza, which is, which is um, what are the next sort of steps for the project and where do you see it going in the next few years? Okay, great question. So we actually developed this rangeland metric and then we are trying to, you know, the quantitatively, you know, assess the rangeland condition. And the next is we are really trying to connect this information with the standard or certification, you know, the measures, because uh, for, for the brands, it's also it required, they need some the documentation evidence, you know, more proven or the written evidence. And for herders also for them to demonstrate or display how they are really, you know, trying to improve the rangeland condition, improve the resources so that they can, you know, in the long run, they can get the better income from their efforts. So next step is work towards the sustainability standards and then connect with the standards, you know, with the quality of Kashmir, with the quality of rangeland. So these are our next step. Um, before that, it's really, as also you, Katrina mentioned, like to pave the road we really need to have a good foundation. So this is the social outcome, ecological outcome, and the economic outcome. But the social outcome is the very first thing. Building the trust among the, among the herders, sharing this, your, the common resources is very critical. And the second thing is how we can, you know, collaboratively reach to the, the better market. So that's how we are really looking towards, working towards. That's great. No, that's super, that's super helpful. And I think the, um, I might add that um, cashmere is a very unique material because unlike cotton or wool, um, the, as you've mentioned, the idea of a, a common sort of standard is still very much under development. And so um, for those who work in the space often, uh, there are a lot of conversations right now around what does sustainable cashmere really mean? Um, and that's a really critical question because sometimes um, brands don't necessarily have huge um, teams of people who are able to really dig in. And so the faster that we can move towards a universally recognizable standard around sustainable cashmere um, is, is really um, something that can help propel the industry forward. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the next question is, uh, that's one, one that's a bit more for caring, which is, and there are a couple of questions that, uh, sort of get the same thing. So I'll just try to group them as best as I can, which is how do you select partners um, to do this type of work? And so, you know, when Caring goes to Mongolia to work in Kashmir or to Australia to work in wool, how is it that we really identify partners? Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think that each geography and each material is very different and it requires a different type of expertise. Um, and so our approach is to really um, just figure out who is leading the way in the space when it comes to sustainability. And we match that ba again back to our EPNL to look at where the, um, where the impacts are greatest so that we can make investment decisions um, accordingly. Um, and then I guess the last point is that I'll link that to the Caring for Nature Fund. Um, we will select um, particular countries um, and align them with particular materials that we'd really like to focus on. Um, and so we're really excited to see applications, of course, you know, from the usual players, but we're also really excited to see um, who else is out there in the world doing exciting work in regenerative agriculture um, that we can potentially partner with. Um, okay, and then um, I think one more question, um, which is around, um, which is around communication to the consumer. Um, so the question is, how, how is all of this information communicated to the consumer? Um, and I think that that, um, obviously I work at Caring and 
that type of communication is very brand specific in our case. And so if you were to go to um, Gucci or Saint Laurent or Balenciaga, it's, they all have a very different approach to how they engage their consumers. Um, I think that there are, uh, you know, oftentimes um, information about programs like this at Caring is, is at sort of the Caring level. Um, and so I'd invite you to dig around on our sustainability um, page on the Caring website. Um, there's a lot of very rich content there, not only on the Mongolia program, but on many other programs that we have around the world. Um, okay, I think that that's, I think that those are the main questions that we were able to answer before we run out of time. I see that the clock is ticking. Um, and so Shansa, any, um, any last words for the listeners? Yeah, it was. It is a very great opportunity to bring what we are really trying to achieve and working on the ground. And uh, thanks for the questions. And uh, this is really great uh, opportunity for us to collaborate with caring and then bringing these uh, changes uh, towards the sustainable uh, production pathway. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for for being here. Thank you so much. I know it's already past midnight out in Mongolia. Um, so it's been a real treat to have you here. And thank you again. And thank you everyone who, who joined. Have a great day. Have a great day.